I haven't made a video in a while, so figured I'd make one. Uh, thank you to anyone who helped me out with the rough situation with the fire. I'm doing much better now. Settled into my new apartment and got through the semester, so doing better. And then uh, I also wanted to say that uh, one of my friends put up an album of music on Bandcamp of guitar and banjo music. And it's some of the best music you'll hear out nowadays, so I think uh, I'd recommend you guys to go check it out. I'll put a link in the description here, but uh, yeah, it's excellent stuff. <laughs> and I'll, I'll also put a link, so yeah, me and him actually did a video for the new sightings of the black hole that just came out a little bit ago. So I'll put, I'll put a link to that too. I think you guys would like that one. But uh, so yeah, just uh, this video I mostly wanted to talk about William Gaddis. And I actually made notes for a video on William Gaddis over a year ago. And I had it all planned out and it was going to be a long video, but I, it, I just didn't feel like I... I was justified in making a video about William Gaddis, so I didn't make one, but today I just kind of decided it's going to be kind of an easy video, just talking about whatever, so even though you guys probably know a decent amount about Gaddis, uh, he was born in 1922, and um, you know, that puts him, Arno Schmidt was 1914. Miklos Senkuthi, 1908. Um, Hart Crane was 1899. And, uh, yeah, so he was basically in college during World War II. That's, that's, uh, the generation he was in. Uh, lived through the Great Depression in his teens. And, yeah, pretty much became a, an adult during World War II. And um, he wasn't wealthy, but his family was all right, because he did get to go to Harvard. And uh, he was actually the, I think it's the president, they call it, of the Harvard Lampoon, which is, you know, the comedy um, publication they have. And uh, he actually was kicked out of Harvard because him and his buddies were causing some trouble and um, one of them was drunk and got hurt, hurt himself. And then the police came to investigate and Gaddis was in a phone booth trying to make a call and the police was telling him to get out. And he told the police to uh, leave him alone using a couple expletives. So um, he, got, he got arrested and that meant that he was uh, expelled from Harvard. And generally when that happened, it was kind of like a weak sort of deal. It was just for the show. And then they would let the student appeal and then they would almost never kick them out. But uh, Gaddis, uh, you know, he had too much dignity to appeal. <laughs> And uh, he, he did later appeal, like a few years later, but they said he had to live in a dorm. And he wasn't about to do that, so he actually never graduated from college. And uh, Harvard should be ashamed. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, after that, he went traveling because... Um, uh, he actually worked for a little bit in New York because he had some connections. Some of his Harvard buddies got him jobs. And then uh, he went traveling. He went to South America. I think he went to Mexico for a little bit. He went to Spain. Um, just traveled for a few years because of the excellent exchange rates for the U.S. dollar after World War II. And... Um, 
This is about the time that he started writing the recognitions. He started it in, uh, pretty sure it was 1947. He started it. Let me do the math. Yeah. Yeah, he started it then, and then he had finished it by 1949 you know he had he had like finished the novel but then he kept adding things up until he submitted a final manuscript of you know 480,000 words so he did he didn't write 480,000 words in you know a year and a half he finished the novel but then he added a whole bunch and um he got the title, The Recognitions, from reading The Golden Bow by James Fraser, the Scottish anthropologist who published that book originally two volumes in 1890, and then it got up to 12 volumes in the early 20th century, around 1905 to 1920 or so. And, um, yeah, The Recognitions was originally going to be a short work as a parody of Faust, a satire of Faust, but he got stuck into it. And then as he was researching Faust, he found in the Golden Bow that uh, the first example that uh, Fraser could find of the Faust legend was in the Clementine Recognitions which was also the first Christian novel. So, and it also had, and there was also a hoax story or a forgery story behind the author because the author was supposed to have been a disciple of Paul, St. Paul, but it wasn't. <laughs> it was written by some other person. So that fit perfectly with the themes of the recognitions, which is forgeries of paintings and Um, religious belief and mythology and trying to find the origins of things and the struggle of an artist or just life as an artist but uh, so he, he wrote it he lived in New York a lot of the time that he was writing it too and uh, he's actually a character in one of Jack Kerouac's novels, The Subterraneans. He's one of the characters in there. So he actually knew some of these Greenwich Village types. And um, yeah, so The Recognitions was published in 1955. Actually, here, I'll, I'll show you uh, the uh, part of a quotation in the, in the Recognitions is from this volume of The Golden Bow by Fraser. Uh, the the dying god is the the book and um, so yeah the recognition was published in 1955 and it was actually advertised pretty well as far as it got wide exposure but it got terrible reviews. Terrible in the sense that they judged the recognitions to be bad and also terrible in that the reviews were themselves worthless. And um, if you would like more information on that, you can read Fire the Bastards by a guy named Jack Green, where he does a thorough analysis of the 55 re reviews of the recognitions that came out. And only two were satisfactory. And um, in here, uh, this was put out by Stephen Moore in Dalkey Archive. But uh, so he says, William Gaddis's The Recognitions was published in 1955. It's a great novel, as much the novel of our generation as Ulysses was of its. It only sold a few thousand copies because the critics did a lousy job. Two critics boasted they didn't finish the book. 
One critic made seven boners. Others got wrong the number of pages, year, price, publisher, author, and title. And other incredible boners like mistaking a diabetic for a narcotics addict. One critic stole part of his review from the blurb, part from another review. One critic called the book disgusting, evil, foul-mouthed, needs to have its mouth washed out with lye soap. Others were contemptuous or condescending. Two of 55 reviews were adequate. The others were amateurish and incompetent, failing to recognize the greatness of the book, failing to convey to the reader what the book is like, what its essential qualities are, counterfeiting this with stereotyped preconceptions, the standard cliches about a book that is ambitious, erudite, long, negative, etc., counterfeiting competence with inhuman jargon, constructive suggestion, fire the bastards. <laughs> And uh, he goes on to say, I first heard of the recognitions from a review in The New Yorker. The reviewer said the book was like Ulysses, but not as good. And then he says, uh, you know, ah, fuck it. Ulysses is a good book. Even a book not as good will probably be pretty good. So he tried, he read it and it ended up being one of his favorite novels. So, um, yeah, that's very, very good. And actually, if you see this photograph on the front, it was taken by one of his friends, Martin Dworkin, who was a photographer and uh, I think he wrote essays too, but he's really not known at all anymore. You can't hardly find anything about him online, but um, basically him and Gaddis would talk at length and Gaddis would include many of the conversations in the recognitions. He would note the conversations down and then you know, put imagine, imaginative versions of the conversations in the book. So Dorkin was basically his, you know, um, in some sense, his intellectual equal helped him write the book. And uh, so, yeah, that, that came out. And then, yeah, Gaddis was pretty bummed out by its lack of positive reception. I think he said later that he wouldn't have been surprised if he won the Nobel Prize for it. <laughs> and he didn't win anything, and really it, it was um, completely underappreciated. Anyway, here's uh, modern printing by the Dalkey Archive. That's a picture of Gaddis in Spain. And really, the modern reviews aren't any better. You know, you have Jonathan Franzen embarrassing himself in public, saying it's the most difficult book he ever voluntarily read, which basically means he's an idiot. And um, also, while I'm at it, a lot of these details that I'm saying came from this book. Nobody grew but the business on the life and work of William Gaddis. And uh, this was recently put out by Joseph Tabby, Tabby, who's a professor in Illinois. I think it came out three years ago, 2005. Double check. Yeah, 2005, so it's pretty recent, but it's excellent. And it also has some really nice photographs of Gaddis too. But uh, of course the details in it are excellent and uh, Gaddis, for being such a um, private person, it's you know very valuable to have this information, I think. Of course, there are people who think um, knowing about the author isn't valuable or something like that, but that would mean you would have to like separate parts of the world, like why would you categorize books as different than an author, you know? Because, uh, you know, there's literally no good reason to not know about a writer if you can. The only good reason to not know information about a writer is because there is no information. That's the only good reason anyone can come up with for, for not learning the biography of a writer. Uh, well, the most common would be laziness. 
but that's not a good reason. The only good reason is because there's none available. If there is some available, there's no good reason not to read it. And uh, I would be interested to hear anyone trying to counter that. But anyway, um, there's also some excellent information on the website of the archive that now holds William Gaddis's manuscripts and papers, which is uh, Washington University in St. Louis. And I'll put a link to that. Um, I think William Gass was the one that pretty much got it there because he was affiliated with the university. And they also have, I think, Samuel Beckett and Raymond Fetterman, so it's pretty, pretty interesting, but I never hear about anyone talking about going there. Uh, the two interesting things about the archive is, um, well, everything's interesting, obviously, but the two things that you never hear about, there's a manuscript for William Gaddis's play, Once in Antietam, a Civil War play that he later used parts from in JR uh, that came out 20 years after the recognition, 1975. And uh, then there's also a screenplay of a Western based on Faust. And I've literally never heard anyone say anything about that. So, and apparently it's like a hundred some pages. So I'm thinking to myself, shit, I want to go up there. But, um, yeah, a little more on the recognition. So, It's written, you know, people call it postmodern, and the only way you could imagine it being postmodern is time-wise. If you imagine postmodern being after the modernists died, and if you confine the modernists to be like James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, T.S. Eliot was still alive, but he wasn't really putting out much good stuff, so on and so on, but in my opinion, William Gaddis is completely still a modernist. I'm not even convinced we're, we're out of modernism yet. Maybe with something like the internet has changed society enough, but I don't think society changed enough between 1922 to 1955 to account for a new a new sort of social consciousness that allows for completely different art style. And of course, Gaddis was not avant-garde or experimental. He was completely influenced by the old novelists like you know, Rabelais or Lawrence Stern or those types, you know, he wasn't trying to do some weird bullshit like cut up technique or whatever, you know, or a road novel like his contemporaries who are objectively worse than Gaddis in every way. And, you know, it makes you wonder why everyone knows who Jack Kerouac is, but nobody has read the recognitions it really makes you wonder. I don't have to wonder too long, but it does make you wonder. And, um, yeah, I, uh, when I re read the recognitions, first time I got halfway through, realized I was missing too much, took a couple months off, and then restarted it, started page one, and then, then I just read it through. And, it's since become one of my favorite books, no question. And it's one of the best books I've ever read. And it actually causes me some difficulty because um, for a long time I, I said, you know, for a couple of years, I said Cormac McCarthy was my favorite writer. And it was pretty obvious to me and there was no reasonable candidate otherwise. But then, you know, I read The Recognitions and I read Agape Agape and I read uh, I'm still, you know, I haven't read J.R. from page one to the last page, but I've been reading it for over a year now. And 
I've read his letters. I've read his biography. I've listened to stuff available on YouTube. And I can no longer say, obviously, that Cormac McCarthy is my favorite writer. You know, I have to include Gaddis in there. And... I've noticed a trend with my favorites. Cormac McCarthy became my favorite because I read Sutri and I didn't understand it. And then I read it again and it became my favorite book. And that also happened with Gaddis where I read the recognitions, half of it, and I didn't understand it. And then I waited a little bit, read it, and it became one of my favorite books. And I think that's the way you have to read. You have to read just at the level that you can understand or just a little behind it. So to say that you're reading stuff that's, that's too good for you or too intelligent for you. Of course, you can't go too far ahead because then you won't get anything and you'll be throwing your time away. I think when you notice you, you're reading a writer that's too difficult, you should say, oh, maybe give it a year, you know, a year at most. Because in my Joyce class, uh, it was a shit show. I don't even want to go into it, honestly. But uh, yeah, Portrait of the Artist was ahead of most people. I'll just put it that way. And we had to read Ulysses, and we never even got to Finnegan's Wake, which is a shame. But um, yeah, I actually had to write a final project. I decided to write a little short story about an imagined encounter in the rare book library at my university about a, about meeting a Hungarian guy who uh, was an expert in Joyce. <laughs> and he kind of gives these, you know, extended monologues of his thoughts. And the final, the one I ended with was inspired by the Confidence Man by Herman Melville, which I think is really the the originator in the American tradition that the recognitions by Gaddis falls into. There's a Goodreads reviewer who said that the recognitions is the Moby Dick of the 20th century, and yeah, of course, I agree. The interesting thing is they were written almost 100 years apart. And Herman Melville and William Gaddis were 33 whenever the book came out, each book. It was three years difference. Herman Melville was born in 1819. William Gaddis was born in 1922. Moby Dick came out in 1851, and then Recognitions came out in 1955. I think it was like, what, March of 1955? I don't know, but anyway. Yeah, and uh, when I read the recognitions, I mean, the writing is top, top level. And if you don't think it is, you're wrong, and you might as well not even try to write anything yourself. And then the story is enjoyable, and he doesn't make it obvious, you know, like, like a Victorian novel, where you don't even want to read it because it's so obvious. And, but, but the two things he's best at apart from everything else, the writing style, what he decides to write about, the themes, whatever, you know, it's all excellent. But I, in my opinion, the things he's best at, first is dialogue. He has excellent dialogue. You can't find a, a wrong line, you know, and McCarthy's the same way. And uh, so that's number one, you know, the dialogue is excellent. But then really the m most interesting part is the the intricacy of the characters, so the complexity of the characters, and how many characters there are that are complex. It's just so enjoyable to read and then open up to a random page and just read for a little while and rebuild everything back in your head and kind of just dip into it because 
ever since I read it, I've been obsessed with the 50s. Like, the 1950s are so weird. Like, the United States had huge economic growth, massive birth rate. Playboy was started in 53. They were building computers. John von Neumann was coming up with early ideas of artificial intelligence, you know, nuclear bombs and black holes came in the 60s, you know, it's like, and then when you look at the politicians that were alive, they're the dumbest people you'll ever meet in your life. Like, Like Eisenhower was just some random military guy. He's fairly smart, sure. And his speech about the military industrial complex is, is good. He's a good guy, but you know, then you have John F. Kennedy, who was again decent. Then you have Lyndon B. Johnson, who was brain dead. You know, just. And then at the same time, you have people designing nuclear bombs and someone like Gaddis writing the recognitions. It's, it's like there are two cultures, you know, the culture that elects presidents and then actual humanity who's a hundred years ahead of everything else. Because people still haven't understood the recognitions, what he says in it. And he said, I, I thought I could, you know, publish the recognition, everyone would say, you know what, we are doing all that wrong, let's fix it. Of course he didn't actually believe it that directly, but it's all in there. I mean, he critiques the pharmaceutical industry about advertising these horrifying drugs that get people addicted and make them zombies. And this is in 1955, we still have that. We have an opioid epidemic, for God's sake. Because pharmaceutical industries convince doctors to just pump that shit out and advertising and the variable value of art, rich people buying a painting for $110 million so they can launder the money for their future generations and it's like, um, Yeah, it's, it's all in the recognitions and nobody reads it. But the thing that meant the most to me about the book when I read it is the main character is a painter who uh, was good early on, noticed to be good early on. And as he got very good, it became more and more difficult to make an original work. And so then he made forgeries, like uh, forgeries of the ma the great masters, like Hieronymus Bosch or Hugo van der, van der Goes, I don't know how to say their names, Hans Memling. And I don't, I don't have that anxiety, but I do think that if someone's trying to be original, they're probably going to be one of the least original artists out there. And I think if someone is trying to participate in the tradition, they'll feel like the most original artist. And uh, where I got this idea was Miklos Senkuthi, because people would always after he published Prey, people would always invite him to avant-garde artist talks in Europe, you know, and he would go there and he would talk about <laughs> Shakespeare and all the, all the great classics, you know, Ben Jonson and Robert Burton and so on. And he would say how similar, you know, how the techniques and the, the interests and the form they use 
is exactly what he's doing and what other people are doing who are considered avant-garde. And the greatest artists are always going to be the least innovative in that sense. Only a horrible writer would have to be innovative. And uh, I think in some sense that's what Gaddis says. You know, if you can't write, then you have to rely on being innovative or experimental or avant-garde. And uh, it also comments on the struggle of creating something that you imagine because it's kind of an obvious phrase and anyone knows this even if you, you know you're not creative it's uh the thing that you make if you have an imagination the thing that you make is going to be worse than what you imagine always always it's 100 percent and this also is generally the case in life you know, you imagine going to a party. You go to the party and you wish you didn't go because what you imagined was better. And in some sense, the anticipation of going is what's actually valuable. And this is what Kierkegaard talks about. There's a funny anecdote that's probably not true, but apparently he had made a plan to meet uh, Regina Olson which was uh, the, the girl that loved him and the girl that he loved. And uh, they had a plan to meet. So he uh, gets in, you know, gets in the carriage, goes all the way there. And then uh, once he gets there, he leaves. And he says that, uh, you know, the anticipation is the most satisfying thing. The buildup is the reason to go. But once you get there, it's, uh, there's no point in staying. And I think that relates to why Amazon is one of the biggest companies in the world. But anyway, yeah, because one of the main lines of the recognitions is, thank God there's gold to forge. You know, in one sense, thank God we have Shakespeare to copy. You know, thank God for Shakespeare that he had the ancient Greeks and Romans to copy. And in the same way, thank God that we have an imagination that is always better than what happens in real life. But because our imagination is so excellent, in the literal sense it excels, that what we create is still very good, such as the recognitions. And in that, in that art, neat. But, um, yeah, I guess I'll just briefly talk about JR next, and I'll end it. Oh yeah, and if you want to look for Faust, I'd recommend this translation, David Luke. It's very good. And uh, so yeah, JR, I have this copy with, uh, actually it's an Andy Warhol piece of art, oddly enough. Yeah, JR is published 20 years after the recognitions. It's chiefly in dialogue, though not all in dialogue. And one of the most horrifying things, you see this quote on the top there? It says, a major achievement, one of the most brilliant and complex of recent comic novels, one that can be fairly compared to Catch-22 and Gravity's Rainbow. The only problem with that quote is that Catch-22 and Gravity's Rainbow cannot be fairly compared with J.R. So... I don't know what this guy from Newsweek is trying to say, but yeah, but yeah, JR is, uh, it's funny, but it's also extremely depressing because instead of focusing on the artist necessarily or forgeries or this or that, it mainly focuses on the abuses of economics in our system, people becoming hyper-rich and 
stock market stupidity and unbelievable greed in America that of course has also not been fixed but the thing that makes JR great is that Gaddis has a perfect ear for dialogue and he realized he did and that's why he did this because it's all perfect it's all perfect and there are tons of excellent lines but uh and his final book is Agape Agape, which I've read. And uh, it's a final culmination of everything. And he wrote it out of, partially out of influence of Thomas Bernhard. And uh, I think, even though I miss some stuff. Oh yeah, one funny thing, Rectal Brown, the, one of the characters in the Recognitions. Uh, if you like switch around the letters in the name and you can find the word bankroller in there. <laughs> but uh, I think I'll end it with a quote by William Gass, who was actually friends with Gaddis in the 80s and on, and uh, gave a talk in 1994, an introduction to Gaddis, an introduction to a speech by Gaddis about religion, and this is what, this is what Gass says about his friend. I have found myself momentarily happy that man is such a mean and selfish small-time hustler because he thereby furnishes William Gaddis such a satisfying target. So, yeah. Hope you enjoyed the video. Death is a gang boss. New York City, January 4th, 1955.